first course for you anyways, so you can come in. My name is Jason. This talk is uh, all developed by Google, but uh, you'll see it's not only Google, it's Facebook, Microsoft, Uber, Twitter, like everyone's doing it. Sort of. So, this is off. Hello, turn on. Yay. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to tell you about myself, I'm going to ask you some questions so I know who I'm talking to, and then I'm going to go through some color misconceptions because there's quite a few. Uh, my name is Jason Jean. I work at Someone Angular. I work on a tool called NX, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And then I also work at Narwhal, which is one of the sponsors. Uh, we help corporations develop like Google, and you're going to learn what that actually means today. So. At Narwhal, we do consulting, we do engineering, we do training, right? So we'll go into a company and we'll help kind of level up the engineers, we're a bunch of experts. So either it's Angular experience, it's setting up a monitor info, or just trying to help your developers be more successful at what they do, making products, making money, good stuff. So there's uh, three products over there. Um, NX is the first one, this is the one you're gonna be hearing about today. Um, this is the website, you can find out more at nx.dev, but I'll be talking about it today. So. Um, the next one is Angular Console. If you use Angular, um, you might use the Angular CLI. Angular Console is the UI for the CLI, and it's built like we have a plugin for VS Code, so you see it all through there. AngularConsole.com, you can learn more. Next is uh, Normal Connect. So this is our developer environment platform. Um, it has like quick recipes that help you solve your problems. It'll have like topic explorers so you can learn more about certain topics like UWAs, performance, stuff like that. And then also live events, courses, and I think the best thing is our books. So these are the books by people from Normal. Um, we have four of them right now. They're all really good, especially if you're using Angular, but the second one is for everybody. So those are free if you're on the platform. It's free, you sign up. Yeah. Uh, so, I have some questions for you guys. All right, how many people build products in an organization? Okay, surprisingly, not that many. How many are developers? Okay, I got more people there. Uh, okay, how many people build multiple products? So like, not just one, but like two or three. Cool. Uh, does your organization share code? So that means like published NPM and stuff like that. No? Yeah? Okay. Um, and then do you work in multiple repos? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you you're wrong. But um, like, it's not always the answer, but I'll tell you like some of the struggles with working in multiple repos. And I don't know, you can choose to continue or like if it's working for you, that's great. And like many corporations are successful doing multi repos, so you'll be fine. Um, all right, JavaScript developers, cool. And then have you used the next? All right, great. So nobody's used the next. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you more about it. Here's some common misconceptions. So um, a lot of people think that a modern repos is one big thing, and it's all about putting your code in the same place. Um, in reality, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Um, like, there's a lot more to it, and I'll tell you about it today. Next thing is how you store your code is not how you ship and not how you build. So if you think of a warehouse, you store a lot of products there, but um, you don't ship them all at once. And a lot of people think that if all your code's in one place, then it has to be built all at once and shipped all at once, and um, it's just not true. A lot of repo is not a monolith. Okay, so like um, in the world of microservices, micro frontends, monoliths are, you know, they're pretty bad. They're slow to build, they're slow to deploy. Um, you, know, you can not break out a piece of it and just deploy that. Um, monorepo is not the same thing, right? A monolith is one huge thing that you can't split up. A monorepo actually facilitates modularizing your code even better. Okay? So now that we're done with that, I can go to the fun part and talk about NX. All right, so NX allows you to develop like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Uber, Twitter, lots of big people. Um, so how, how does that actually work? And then I'll go into why they actually do it. So how, um, they probably use a framework, some choose Angular, some choose React. Uh, if your framework's up to you, 
But um, like this doesn't even have to be a framework. It can just be regular like down to the metal code. So they probably do more than one application. Um, they might do a, a backend application, and that symbol over there is nest, little cat thing, and then um, React, whatever you want. And then they share a lot of code between these applications. Like if you have three applications, you don't want to be writing everything three times. So they'll share a lot of code, which is what those symbols are, and they'll be recurring throughout the presentation. Uh, but they do it all in this thing called a modern code. Like everything's all in one place. Um, you probably, like people that raise their hands, that use multiple repos, you have multiple repos, and then like code is linked some other way, right? But um, these companies, a lot of successful companies, they choose this pattern to store all their code in one place and use that to their advantage. So when we go into why, what's wrong with multiple repos, right? Like GitHub has tons of them. Um, if you look into just one repo, you need to put it on GitHub so that other people can get it, right? Um, you need to probably publish it at NPM if you want somebody else to get it from outside the repo. Then you need to set up some build tools, so you might be using TypeScript, or you need Webpack, you need to set those up. And you need to set up CI and testing, right? So this all takes some time, but you'd think like maybe if you do it once, you can do it again, easy peasy, and then you get this, right? So like everything, every repo needs these kind of things. You have a ton of libraries, you have a ton of applications, you've set it up six times through. Right? And this is like the minimal example that I'll be going through in terms of like how much code your company might have. Right? But um like you could have only one app and you could have like split out modules and you would need to set up some some build tools and stuff like that for them. Okay, so how does the modern code help? This is um, a subset of the same, same projects. With the modern repo, you set up your tools, they're there, and then you add up new projects, right? And they're just, you know, they work with the same tools that you already have. You don't need to set it up again. It's already there. Um, there's also dependencies between these projects. Like, they're not like independent, floating around. Like, sure, there might be multiple repos, but they all depend on each other. Like, you own the code, all the code, for a reason. It's because they work with each other to achieve what you want to achieve. So they all depend on each other. And if you say, hey, I work on the React app, I want to change something in this library. So you say, all right, I got to work on that library, right? Pull down the repo, make your changes, make a pull request, yada, yada, yada. And then you can publish it to NPM. And then you can go out and work on the app, right? Um, if you're dealing with multiple repos, you probably do this quite often. Um, it's great that you have it in a uh, separate repo, but it requires a lot more steps to do what you want. Versus in a modern repo where you're allowed to make atomic changes, which just means that like when you need to make a change, you just go and make the change everywhere, and then you commit it all at once. You don't have to pull multiple repos, get multiple people involved, or like anything, right? Like it's just all one place. Another thing is version mis mismatch. So when you have dependencies, you will depend on the version of it, right? So, so okay, so the library on the left over there, that is depending on version 1.0 of this like bottom library, right? Which is all great until bottom library decides, hey, we're gonna make it 2.0. Left library is still on version one and the right library is on version two. So then the app at the top, when they go to build, they're like, what do I use? Do I use version one or do I use version two? Right? And this might happen just because, you know, for the people that maintain library on the left are just busy right now. They don't want to update to version two. And like your end product actually suffers from it. Right? So this is what's known as a diamond dependency problem. Um, it's a well documented issue about multiple repos and like versioning your dependencies and stuff like that. So the solution is once again modern repos. Um, so, same diagram over there, everything's in one repo, there's only one version in play at any time, right? Like every time you make a change, you can make a change to everything, but in your repo, there's only one version, it's the current version. You never have to worry about updating it and stuff like that, it just kind of evolves with your repo. So everything's here. Um, okay, so a lot of people say, as I was talking about before, all my code's in one place, I don't want to deploy all my code, so I'm going to split it up. Right? 
Um, so if you want to make a change to the React app, you know, you just want to make a text change, um, you're, you don't want to deploy everything. So don't, right? Like just build that application and then um, ship it to your users, everyone's happy. Um, everything else stays the same. You know, like the libraries never got touched and the other applications, they don't need to, need to change at all. So the similar question is what gets tested. Whenever you make a change, you want to test all your changes to like be confident about where you're changing and not breaking stuff. So if I'm working on that library down there to the right, um, what gets tested, right? Um, usually if you're in one repo, you should kind of just test everything, right? Like that's, easiest, that's the easiest way to do it. You don't have to think about it. Just kind of run all the tests, right? Uh, but in a, in a modern repo, and like when you see these dependencies being drawn, you don't have to test everything. You only have to test the things that get affected. So if I change that library, React app is using it, well then I need to test the React app and I need to test that library. But the Angular app and the Nest app over there, you don't need to touch them. So that's about why they do this, right? Um, I think these are some compelling reasons. So I'm gonna tell you about a tool called NX. It was developed by Narwhal. As I said, we help corporations build like Google. And along the way, we just like, we quickly learned the tooling needs to be there for this to happen. Um, those things that I talked about, like deciding um, what gets tested, like you don't want to be the one doing that. Like a person doesn't want to be the one doing that. That should be automated in a tool. So that's what NX is. The first two points I'm going to kind of just breeze through because that's not what the topic of this talk is, but they're amazing. So I'm going to go through them real quick. NX allows you to use modern tools out of the box. If you're in the JavaScript ecosystem, you might have heard of things like Prettier, Jest, Cypress, Nest, and um, basically like anything. Um, the abstractions are in there. Um, you're going to use anything you want. You're not locked into the set of tools by any means, but some of the more modern ones that have some kind of like advantages over the old ones, they're available out of the box for you. And you also get to build full stack. So in order to ship an application, you probably don't just build a front end and like a static website and ship it. Most serious applications will have a back end, you'll have a database, you'll have like tons of stuff, right? And you'll want to work on that stuff. And if it's all in one place, that's even better. And then the last thing is develop like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, people that are successful. And I'll go into three different reasons uh, or like three different ways that NX helps you build like them, but it all boils down to being holistic about how you do things, so everything's in one place, um, being intelligent, right? So like deciding what needs to be built, what needs to be tested, and not doing anything more than you have to, right? Like all that time goes to waste. And then being consistent. Um, when you have like a lot of projects, a lot of code, you know, a lot of engineers, you want to be consistent throughout the whole thing so that everybody can get the latest best practices, you can define them for yourself and stuff like that. So to be holistic, Google builds a lot of products, right? And I'm saying they're one of the companies that like not only use this method of keeping everything in one place, but they like pioneer it. They like they spend a lot of time into building their infrastructure so that they allow this type of development and they build a ton of products, right? And if they all live in this repo, right, like it works for them. And cohesive teams build cohesive products. So it's not just about your dev experience. It's not just about keeping everyone like working in different projects, like separated. But if you build them all in the same place, they're going to feel more cohesive. And when the end user gets that product, they're going to feel like, wow, this company like really hasn't figured out. And I mean, like you can ridicule Google about like how many different products they have. But even this slide, which I just kind of threw together, you can see how it feels sort of united, and cohesive, and you kind of just know it's from the Google brand, right? And like other companies like Microsoft, Facebook, once again, like they all built this way, and I think they have a pretty good track record of successful products. The next thing is um, being intelligent about what you do, right? So we were talking about working on the, pro the project over there to the right, and NX has this thing called Affected, and will allow you to do an effective test, effective build, and uh, it basically just says like, hey, if you're working on that library over there, 
you only need to worry about the two products over there, or like the two projects over there. So whether it's testing it, building it, linting it, like whatever, or like just worrying about it, right? Like sometimes you make a change and you're like, oh, I really hope I didn't like take down the, the front page or something like that. You don't have to be worried about it anymore. Um, this will kind of tell you like you're safe or you actually affected everything, right? And maybe you should break it up into smaller changes and stuff like that. Next is a dependency graph. So this is another command by NX. Um, we statically analyze your code. We'll figure out the dependencies for you so you don't have to like maintain these dependencies. You could, um, but we can do it for you. So you can visualize how your code looks. And this is only two applications, the uh, rectangles over there, one of them is Prime, one of them is Admin. These are only two applications, but there's like five shared libraries, right? And like usually some architect will go and make a diagram, they'll post it on your like like uh, internal wiki, they'll be like, guys, this is our systems architecture, right? And then like the next day somebody will be like, I just created a new piece, but didn't add it to the diagram. So it's like out of data writing. Um, we automatically generate this for you. You can do this whenever you want. Any developer can just, from their terminal, generate this dependency diagram and kind of say like, oh, you know, the bug I'm working on needs to be, um, like probably needs to be done in admin feature permissions. I wonder what is affected by that, right? And usually you kind of go to a separate document and talk to like someone that's worked there for like 12 years and then you'll know like, oh, by the way, you're about to break the front page, like don't work on that. So, yeah, we visualize it for you. And this makes something that's usually very complicated, very visual and simple, and you can look at it, you can keep track, of, keep track of it over time, you can sometimes see like circular dependencies in here, and a lot of so. So, to be consistent, you can't just have a bunch of code in one place and say like, all right guys, it's the Wild West, you know, everyone can depend on everything else, Sometimes you want to constrain these things. So you can tag your projects. This is just kind of an arbitrary string that you come up with. Um, what we usually recommend and what's a good starting place for most organizations is you type them by the type of code that's in that project, and you type them by the, um, the scope that you hope that that project's used by. So you can scope some things like just your application, right? Or you can scope things to like, hey, this is shared, everybody should be using this, so please use it. And if you're not part of that scope, don't use it, right? So when you go and make these um, dependencies, it'll actually yell at you through a linting rule that, hey, you know, like, library should not depend on libs, it should go the other way around, and state should not depend on UI. I don't know how many front-end developers are here, but it's just a general bad practice. Um, and one more thing is workspace schematics. So NX is, as a tool generates a lot of code for you. So like if you want an application, if you want a library, it'll generate that for you. It works with a lot of different uh, frameworks, right? But sometimes you might want your own. Something about code generation that's hard to get right is having the right amount of options for everybody. And every organization wants their own setup for how to do a component, how to do like an application. So you can actually write your own uh, schematics or code generation and enforce your own standards, right? Another thing this is good for is going through all of your code, since it's in one place, programmatically refactor it to like the new best practice that you came up with or like a new function that you wrote that replaces an old one. Instead of making that change in 10 different repos and then saying like, all right, you know, I spent like two years doing this, finally migrated over to the new version, you can just automate that in your one repo and Google does this at scale, right? Like all of their C++ code, all of their Python code, all of their JavaScript, Java, like that all gets automatic migrations. And in fact, like they make, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but a majority of the commits made to their repo is from an automated process that just handles making commits at a large scale. So those are the things that NX does for you. Um, I want to leave a bit more time because I think there'll be questions, especially for people that haven't used a monitor before, like heard about it. Um, you can follow us. Narwhal is at um, at narwhal underscore io. So please follow us on Twitter, website narwhal.io. I'm at Frozen Pandas pretty much everywhere, and then you can follow NX as well. So nx.dev as you saw before, and also at NX Dev Tools on Twitter. 
so you can follow kind of like tips and tricks for how to do this. So uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation here. I hope everyone has questions for me. Otherwise, I can do like a live demo if you want, so you can see how the tool works. But I'm going to try and give you guys a chance to do questions first. Anybody? Do you have a, a go-to strategy for companies that are using Google's and Google's repos to start them on the path towards getting down to one single repo or just paring down the number that they use? Yeah, so it's up, it's up to your organization. Um, it's actually down to the people. If the people are actually just working as a team already, and it's like one team and they just happen to have multiple repos, I think the better solution is just to like dive in Put everyone in the same repo, maybe like break a couple rules here and there, and then like fix those as it gets better and go from there. Right? So those are things like the dependency constraints that you saw before. Like maybe lids can like depend on apps for now, but those are like temporary like practices that you want to shake off. If your corporation is say like ginormous or everyone's actually already siloed working in separate teams already, um, you might want to dedicate like one team to kind of start the monitoring go, make sure all the infrastructure is in place so that once it's in place, you can just kind of start adding teams on as they're ready. So it depends on your organization. Do it all at once, do it one at a time. And uh, use tools where you can. You know, like automate it. That's a little bit more advanced. Sometimes it's better just to do the manual labor. Yes? So you mentioned all the good stuff about one or two repos. What are some bad things? So some of the bad things is um, like some of the reasons why it might not work for you is if you're doing client projects. So I asked like how many people are building products, and the reverse of that is um, people like us, like uh, ironically, that deal with multiple different clients, right? And they definitely don't want their code right next to another person's code. So um, privacy, not in terms of like you know your personal data or whatever, but like privacy of the code, right, um, becomes sort of an issue. You can constrain those dependencies as we talked about before, and say like, hey, the scope for this is like just my application. Um, we don't do it now, but Google actually has like a, a more kind of like rigid sense of like ownership. So like you don't lose ownership by any means in a mono repo. Um, it just kind of gets hidden. Like GitHub does a lot of ownership for you. So like just by having a repo, this is for better or for worse, you'll have like permission set up, right? But for a mono repo, like everybody just gets added to the one repo, right? Um, so there's other ways to go about it. Um, how I like to say it is that like everybody has visibility into all of the code. You work at the company, you should be able to see like the back end, even if you don't work on it and stuff like that. But um, who actually owns it and like handles reviewing the code and merging it in and actually committing the change to it, that can be constrained, right? Like that's organizational. You can say like, hey, you know, my team is the only team that can touch this really core library because you know bad things happen, like bad things get merged in here. So yeah. But, like that's one of the bad things. It becomes a concern. But it, it's a it's an addressable problem. Google has it. We just don't have any like wide solution for you because you might not be using GitHub and stuff like that. Any other questions? Yes. What's the largest number of single or single repositories that go to production that you've seen a company use? Do you like a uh, number of projects? Uh, different repositories. Okay. Again, if they're using GitHub Enterprise and they have yeah. like, all these different yeah, so some of our clients are like uh, big banks, and they just have like many um, lines of business, they'll call it. So like, um, if you imagine a bank, they'll do like auto loans, house loans, um, car loans, stuff like that, right? And those are all split up. So I imagine some of our clients have upwards of like 15, 20 projects in multiple repos. And like, they've been doing it, but they feel the problem, so. Have, that's, you, seen, have you seen companies with hundreds of repos? Yeah, like um, if you imagine Google would like split up their, their projects like that, um, there'd be hundreds. Like Microsoft also doesn't have all of their code into one monorepo. Then like Windows is their biggest monorepo, but they'll also have like 
other projects all in the same model repo. Um, I guess that's another like, I don't know, like disclaimer is that like not your whole company has to be in one repo, right? Like you can still divide it up into multiple repos, but I like the general thing that I guess like from someone that's worked with modern repos before is that the way that businesses and teams divide up the repos is like way too aggressive right now. It's just like it's a back end, so it has to be separate from the front end, and that's not always the case. Other questions? Do I have time for a demo? Yeah. Yeah? Let's see it. So, I'm going to drop this one. Is this my clock? Okay. And here, this is already an existing repo, so that's boring, right? So, I have this lovely temp directory. You can do um, mpx create an x workspace. Um, I'm going to use the latest version and then call it whatever you want. So I'm going to call it Yeah. All right, so this is going to go install NX, the tool that I was talking about, and like scaffold an empty workspace for you. Uh, so this is not going to have an application yet. It's not going to have any libraries. Like you can't deploy this anywhere. Um, but it does have the infrastructure for you to start building things into it. Right? Um, for any JavaScript developers here, I'm going to just choose React as a preset. And this is going to stick a, a React app into my project to begin with. Yeah. Um, this is going to take a while, yada, yada, yada. Never do live installs on stage. You can avoid it. But um, I mean, if I'm telling you to create something, it's kind of hard. So it's creating more stuff. Let me go. Questions? No? Okay. Um, so I'm using React here. You can also use Angular. You can use um, like any JavaScript you want, basically. Um, technically, the technology is there to be abstracted, so you can use Java and other languages as well. But um, it's not up there yet. People haven't done it and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so this is our new project. Um, whoa, this is the wrong thing. Let's, uh, okay, so this is our repo. It has an apps directory. Those are like the icons you saw at the top. And it has a libs directory, which is like shareable code, right? Um, our apps directory has like devto, right? That's the name I gave this project. This might be an app for attendees to be able to like network with other people, right? Um, but then, you know, if I'm the organizer, I might want to generate like another application, and this one's for admins, right? Like this one, maybe you manage users, you say like, hey, there's an event tonight, stuff that you don't want general public to be able to do. So we're gonna split this out into a different application, right? I'm gonna choose some like default, default configuration. That's gonna go and do that. Um, so I actually haven't like, said any dependencies yet, right? I'm going to go ahead and do um, darn depthrap. I can't spell. So this is our dependency graph. These two applications don't depend on each other, right? If I zoom in, you can see one's called devtl, one's called admin, right? And there's end-to-end -end applications that depend on them, but they're just end-to-end -end tests, right? Um, so if I go back to the code here, if I generate a library, this is a bad name for it, and you shouldn't really do this because you want to split up your project so that they can be testable. Logic. <laughs> Listen to the last talk. Um, so um, you want to split up your project as mo like as much as possible. For demonstration, I'm just going to assume that like you have this one core library that everyone uses, right? Um, so that's generated, and so I'm going to run depth graph just to show you that it's there. It's not going to be that exciting. Don't hold your breath. Um, that's our new library right here, right? And um, this is TypeScript, JavaScript code, whatever you will. Um, if I go into my application, right? Like I'm just navigating to this place 
in my repo, if I look at the code, I can import that library, say um, fpo slash core, right? That's our library. We hit save. Now I'm depending on a different project from my my Dentio app, right? The app that everyone uses. If I say your app graph again, um, I'll show you the prettier version. How about that? Um, so this is on um, Angular console. If we go and look at the dependency diagram, we'll get this out so it looks nice. You'll see Dentio end to end. Um, that things happen when you zoom in. Okay, so I should lie, I am added to my admin app. But anyway, so you can see admin end to end depends on admin, depends on core. Right? And if I were to make a change to core, so let's just emulate that with the button press, you only need to test this part of the repo. So if I click the test affected button, this is going to run the tests for um, DevGeo or that. Um, sorry. So, <laughs> one second. Getting ahead of myself. Uh, all right. What just happened? I just closed. No, okay. Um, one second. I'm going to commit all this to get. Hello, DevGeo. Okay. And that's it. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna actually like make a change. So if I go back to my projects here, i zoom in so everyone can see. Um, if I go down to my library, this is the one that I generated called core, and say like, whenever I import this, I wanna say like, console.log, hello, dev, you know, right? So now I've made a change, and if I open the dependency diagram again, you'll see that um, part of it is already highlighted, right? Like this portion of it is red, the top portion is still grayed out. It's for this intents and purposes, not important right now because it's not being affected. There's no way that the change that I made is going to affect that application. So when I go and test whatever's affected and run this, you'll see that only core and admin show up here, right? Those are the two apps that are affected by this change. And you'll see core test passed, admin tests hopefully pass. I mean, they should. Um, so like now you know that this change is good. If you didn't have to test the DevPO app, Right, so this is just for testing. Um, as I said, it lets you do building, lets you do linting, and just like do the most minimal amount of work that you can in order to verify that all your code is safe. But like, um, code publication is part of it because if all the projects are in one place, it's really hard to say like, hey guys, I published a new version of my NPM package. Like, everybody, number one, update your code and then test it. Let me know if it works, and then I'll like fix anything that doesn't work. This can all be done at once. All these checks can be run before anything gets committed into the repo and stuff like that. Should it? Uh, I would, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Any questions after that? What, what was the ETV, end to end convention? <clears throat> so you created like, this DevDeal and then this DevDeal end to end? Tests. Yeah, so uh, these are the projects that were created. Um, Admin is like your source code, and you would build this and like ship it, I guess like not too far because it's your admin app, right? Um, but for the end-to-end -end test, this is just another application that has kind of like automated end-to-end um, -end or like integration tests, which aim to test like your whole system, right? So that whatever the user sees, it still works. If I wanted to run this, I have the uh, admin end-to-end -end test over here, um, click run, end-to-end, -end, and this uses Cypress. So Cypress is a way to automate your testing. Um, it's like Selenium if you used that before. And eventually a window will pop up. Three, two, 
One. Three to one. <laughs> Three to one. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> right, um, so this is a test that we wrote, it just says like, make sure it says welcome to admin, and then quickly shut it down, say everything works. If we go back to the project, <coughs> we will see, <coughs> where is it? Another reason why you should use a monitoring repo is so that you don't have to open like 10 of those. Uh, that everything passed, right? Um, so those are like meant to emulate a user and to make sure that you can log into the site, you can like, publish a comment and stuff like that. Any other questions? Generally I get a lot of questions about the tools, but I kind of like skipped over that a little bit. So I wanted to like focus on monitoring a bit. But uh, yeah. If you had so like um, Node.js backend code base a separate code base in this yeah. is that are the dependencies illustrated between the front end and the back end, or is it just within? If it's a separate repo yeah. outside of it? Uh, no. Um, like, this only works for inside your repo. It's kind of hard to say, like. No, no, like, if it wasn't within the repo. If it was within the repo. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's the, the front end dependent on some back end service. Or yeah, it... so everything in NX is kind of like a la carte. So if you don't use Node or you don't use React, you don't have to install it when you're installing the other stuff. It just kind of like keeps everything separated so you get the latest amount. Once again, like being efficient and all you need and what you need. So you can add stuff in. Um, I'm going to add in Narwhal. I'll use Nest because that's the um, what we showed before. But um, it's just a Node.js application. Um, this is installing it and running some like just like setup. Right. Um, I'll generate this application. I'll show you how to set up that dependency. Um, generally, like we analyze the code, so it will say like, "Hey, you know, you have this application, which is the back end, and this, which is the front end." And um, they don't actually have code dependencies on each other, right? They don't point at each other. They'll point at like an endpoint, right? But that's not like a clear indicator of like this is the the project that runs that, right? So I'm going to generate a at normal slash node app, and I'll call this my API. Default options. This will generate. Okay, so I'm going to have two separate applications, like I just said. I'm not going to have any dependencies on each other. But something that you might want to do is like typings, right? Um, when you call an API, it'll be like, what does this author object look like? Right? So another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a library. And this time I'm going to use our normal workspace library. Right? I'm going to call this types. I can type surprisingly well, even standing up. I'm surprised too. Um, OK, so let's say that this uh, project, I'm going to go in and say my types here. Right? I'm going to export an interface call attendee because this is what this app is for. They're going to have an ID, which is a number, and a name, which is a script, right? Um, so this type is going to be used by both the attendees app and the API, right? So for my API, if I go into my application, um, this is just how they look. Don't worry too much about it. Um, okay, I messed up a little bit. I'm just gonna try again. At normal nest app and API two because I'm really creative. First two already. Yeah, first two. Um, first one I created is like a just a nest, uh, just a Node.js app, which has like print out hello to the console. I'm too lazy to write my own server, so I'm just going to generate another application and have a, um, a server set up for me. So, API 2. Hooray! We did it. We created a whole new server. Okay, so this is going to be an endpoint that we call, instead of returning this thingy majiggy, right, I'm just going to return, I'm going to say this method returns a um, attendee. Spell that correctly, maybe, maybe not. 
Um, and then this is going to come from my library, right? That's uh, um, so this API uses this type. It's probably yelling at me because this is the wrong type. Whatever, um, ID is zero, and name is Jason. Right? My name, I'm in Sandy. Right, um, so now you can see your graph. Um, from this diagram, you can see your types library here is being dependent upon API 2. And what else would be great if, is if um, our front end, right, also depends on it. So I'm gonna choose the other app because I haven't given it much love yet. Um, application, let's go into like a React thing. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Let's say like the props, you get an attendee and attendee, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and import attendee from that video slash Right, so I've made two dependencies onto the same type base. Right, and if I go and I do join this again, so now you'll see mm -hmm. uh, like your API and the WebPO app both depend on attendee. Right, um, so now when I commit everything. Uh, Don't lie, you make these commits too sometimes. Um, so I'm gonna go to my attendee, or my types, right? And I'm gonna say, hey, you know, this guy also has a birthday. And it's a number, right? So now I've made a change to the attendee. Um, the API, too, and the NFTO app, like, should know about this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's new information that needs to be tested. Maybe I deleted the name or something, right? Like, that needs to be tested. And usually, you publish, like, a backwards compatible API and stuff like that, but um, it's just complicated. So, with the monitor, but you don't have to do it because if I make this change, I can see, um, like, it can figure out Ooh, this color doesn't show up too well. Anyways, you can see how this is a slightly lighter, right? It's actually like bright red. It's like hard to look at on a computer screen. It's just not being shown well here. But um, like you can see that both API 2 and FPO would have to run other tests, other end-to-end -end tests. And like when I submit this pull request, like the CI system is going to run those tests and tell me whether or not everyone has adjusted for this change and whatever, right? So this is another way you can say that like an API and a front end that both depend on the same data are kind of both affected by the change, right? Um, the other way is say like DevPO like actually points the API to, right? So it, it, like, it would make sense for you to draw a dependency there. Whatever we can analyze with code you can just kind of tell us, and we'll add the information on top. So if I go into, there's a configuration file here called annex.json, and I have a project called devpo, right? I'm gonna add what's called an implicit dependency, but you can just kind of think of it as a dependency, right? And then this is going to depend on uh, API 2, right? So now when I do normal uh, depth graph, you'll actually see a line being drawn from DevPO to API 2. Yes. Right? So like if we can't see it through code or like you just know things that we don't, you can give us more information and we'll put it into this graph. And this information will actually be used for like saying what's affected. So if I only make a change to API, Two, I still want to run the end-to-end -end tests for the uh, DevPO front-end application, right? Any other questions? Questions?
next session. That's good. So that's the final talk, but don't go yet. There's some drinks. Uh, I'm going to put up the lots of food. I'm going to put up the tweet if you are interested in attending the conference tomorrow, the special conference. It's at uh, King and John at the uh, TIFF building. And uh, thank you all for coming in. Hope you had a good time. Thank you.